Hello, everybody. How are you? Um, I want to start out by saying a big thank you to my cousin, Kathleen Scaboria. Uh, she's the person who kind of was the catalyst for today, and also Ms. Laura Shepard. So thank you very much for bringing me in, and also for TEDx. I'm so honored to be here. So as you know, my name is Cam Walton, and I am an author. And I have a question. You see that baby up there? I have a question. Um, does anybody in this room think that that baby knows any racist words? No? How about um, any words that are derogatory towards someone's sexual orientation? No? How about mean, nasty words that would put somebody down for how they look or their weight? No? You sure? Because that baby can see perfectly fine. No? Well. Obviously, the baby cannot. And, oh, I need my clicker. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, thanks for that. And obviously, no, because it's obvious. Hatred is learned, OK? No one in this world is knowing any racist words or negative feelings. No one. Human beings are taught how to belittle, and they're taught how to hate. They're taught how to humiliate, and they're taught how to crush. They're taught how to embarrass, and they're taught how to disgrace. But, everybody, I have really good news. We are thinking creatures. Did it work? Wait. Nope. There we go. We know how to learn new things. We know how to change our behaviors. We have that power. And there is a tremendous amount of power in human kindness. Real and measurable power. Not the kind of power that produces electricity or makes cars go. The power is far more important than that. Kindness has the power to lift another human being out of the depths of darkness. It has the power to save lives. So I wonder, the power of human kindness. Let's see if I can, if it'll do it. Oh, did I just hit something and make it go away? That's so funny. <laughs> that's so me. Okay, there it is. Do you want to keep clicking it or should? Okay, that's good. I'll do this little motion to you. So the power of human kindness, what does that even mean? What does compassion and kindness look like and sound like? It could be as small as the smile to a kid that no one else even notices. Kindness actually can be kind of easy. Um, new screen. And, but I want you to consider this. If it's so easy, according to randomhistory.com, students in the world see an estimated four out of every five bullying occurrences at school, and they join in about three quarters of the time. So to me, that means that kids are not only seeing bullying, but they're joining in. So I ask you, audience, why? Why do people feel the need to rip each other down and insult and publicly humiliate? Why? Let me back up a little bit, and let me tell you something. I, before I became an author, I was a teacher. I taught for 12 years, mostly middle school language arts, and yes, I did see my share of bullying. But every bully had a backstory. There was a reason they were acting like such a jerk. Sometimes the bullying was based on anger. Just like my character, his name is Bull, and he is the bully, and that's not by accident, from my novel Cracked. He's an angry guy. But sometimes the bully was just trying to be cool, to show off or to make other people laugh. And sometimes the excuse I would hear was, but Mrs. Walton, I'm just kidding. OK. But the thing is, bullying is not funny. How is it funny to humiliate someone, to embarrass them in front of other people, to break their heart? How is it funny to insult someone by how they look, or talk, or walk, or dress? How is that funny? Answer? It's not. It's traumatic, and it leaves scars. Memories that never go away. I taught a boy who, when he came to me in the fifth grade, and yes, we had fifth grade in my middle school, he had been brutally bullied and tortured since kindergarten. He had been called every anti-gay slur you can possibly imagine. At 10 years old, he developed a bleeding stomach ulcer. At 10 years old, he tried to commit suicide. At 10. I'm gonna call him Sam today. Sam did not wanna come to school anymore. He just could not take the cruelty one more day. And as his teacher, I vowed to do everything in my power to make it stop. Did I know how I was going to do that? No. I even gave his mother my word on the phone when she told me of the suicide attempt. I said, OK, I'm going to do something. 
I thought about it and I thought about it and I got a plan. And my plan was to reach the hearts of the bullies. I knew that's the only way Sam's torture was gonna stop, was if I could make the bullies feel his pain. They had to understand him. So I needed the bullies to put themselves in Sam's shoes. So I asked Sam to write an open letter to my team of students. And with his parents' approval, I wanted him to explain why he was missing so much school, because kids were asking, where's Sam, where's Sam? So I got permission from my principal for the day that he was gonna read his letter to, for him to stay home. And I gathered my team of students and I read Sam's heartbreakingly honest letter. You could hear a pin drop in my classroom. And I caught one of his bullies do one of these real quick. Um, but I asked my team of 57 students, all of them, to each write Sam a letter in return. Well wishes, promises of kindness, perhaps apologies. I took it a step further and I created a secret protection society formed of all of his bullies. There were 11. They had no idea that's why I'd chosen them. I explained that they were natural leaders, which was true, and that's why they were chosen. And the 11 boys named themselves the WBI, Walton's Bureau of Investigation. <laughs> we had WBI members only lunch meetings where I'd discuss empathy and leadership. And the members knew their one and only job was to protect the bullied on the playground, in the lunchroom, in the hallways, on the bus, wherever they were. I secretly flipped the tables on them. And about two weeks into our lunch meeting, one of the bullies, the members, says to me, Mrs. Walton, it's like the craziest thing. Like I'm out there and I'm watching for bullying, but I'm just not even seeing any. And I said, oh, that's just because you're doing such a great job. But inside I'm laughing hysterically thinking, of course there's no bullying because <laughs> you're in the group. No one's bullying because you're watching out for the kids. So it was funny. And Sam did finish fifth grade alive, perfectly happy, and the bullying, the bullying honestly did stop. And it never did return. The bullies felt Sam's pain, and they walked in his shoes. They were brought to an understanding that their behaviors were wrong and damaging, and they needed to stop. And a funny slash heartwarming thing, seven years later, he shows up at my classroom door, Sam. He's a senior in high school. And he came to thank me, and he said that the fifth grade year saved his life. So that was a treasured moment. But on the flip side, unbeknownst to Sam, like three months later, one of his bullies shows up at my classroom. And he says, Mrs. Walton, I know what you did. I figured out what the WBI was. And I said, oh, so you figured it out? He said, yeah, I get it, the flipping the tables part. And he said, but you know what? You know what the WBI did for me? It changed how I look at other people. And I said, oh, really? I said, is it because you peeled the label off of Sam's forehead that you smacked on there all those years and you finally saw Sam the person, not Sam the whatever the derogatory term you felt like slapping on him that day? I don't know why we humans love to label each other, but we're really good at it. I think it's just part of our nature. You know how it works in schools. Oh, that's the blank kid. Oh yeah, that's the blank girl. You can put whatever blank word you want to put in there. We all do it. Even as adults, we label each other. I don't know why, but we do. But when we peel back those labels and we see the person underneath that has feelings and a heart, that's when the bullying stops. Now why did I choose to tell you Sam's story? Because I want everyone in this room to ask themselves this question. How would you like to be remembered later in life? And that goes along with the lovely, amazing girl who had no notes. My gosh, the first girl, I was like, I've got cheat notes here. So she said this exact thing. How do you want to be remembered later in life? The choice is yours. It is always yours. Don't let anybody ever take that power away from you. How would you like to be remembered? The creep who ruined everybody's life or a select few? The kid that ripped other people's hearts out? Or would you like to be the kid that is remembered for treating people with dignity and respect. And it's always at this point that I get like, a, like an eye roll or sometimes people shift uncomfortably because I know what you're thinking. Oh, so you're like expecting us all to be best friends and run off into you know, happy fairy tale land? Is that how it works? Lady up there giving the talk? No, that's not what I'm saying. There are people in the world that I don't like. It's just human nature. You can't like everyone. However, it is not impossible to treat the people that you don't like with basic human dignity. What I mean is, don't huff when they're talking. Don't eye roll. Don't nudge when someone is in class raising their hand. Don't do that. 
that's treating someone with basic human dignity. Even though you want to, believe me, there are a lot of people where I want to go, please stop talking, you're so annoying. But I don't do that because it's disrespectful and it's rude. So it boils down to one thing. Everyone, despite how they look, or dress, or the color of their skin, or who they love, everyone has the basic human right of, treating, of being treated with dignity and respect. It is that simple. And everyone feels. No one can escape feeling emotions. Everyone with a brain and a heart feels. No matter how hard you try and push those feelings down, it's, in, it's inescapable. There isn't a person in this room who hasn't felt pain, sadness, fear, doubt. Your heart knows. But you've also felt happiness and love. Feelings are just part of the human experience. But here's the key. Feelings must be considered. And let me rephrase that just a little bit. Other people's feelings must be considered at all times. Considering other people's feelings is a basic staple of decent human behavior. It's just what nice people do. There's no other way around it. So I used to tell my students that kindness was contagious. Because it is, and I still firmly believe that. One small kind act has power. It can influence the person doing the kind act. It can influence the, first, the person receiving the kind act. But it can also influence people witnessing the kind act. But you have to commit the kind act to start that chain reaction. But what does it look like and sound like, kindness? Think about that for just a second. How can kindness be contagious? Well, treating the human beings that you come in contact with, with basic human decency, is the best way to have that chain start. Considering their feelings. Look them in the eye when you're speaking to them. Don't roll your eyes. Don't, when they're talking, say, yeah, yeah. That's disrespectful. Smile, a tiny smile. You don't know the power that a smile could have to a kid that's invisible. A smile could be the day that they were gonna kill themselves, and your smile could be the day that they go, oh, they see me? I'm here. Say hello. These are small things, tiny things, things that make other people feel alive and seen and respected. Basic human decency. Because positive interaction has the power to create more positive interaction. Everyone in this room, adults included, have the power to make someone else feel respected, feel alive, show someone they care even complete strangers that you would normally never say a word to. You have that power. That's the power of human kindness. And to the bullies out there in this room, I say one word, stop. You don't have the right. Stop ruining other people's lives. You may think that in intimidation and aggression give you that power, you get that surge, but here's the thing, that power is short-lived. Kind of like the energy surge that you get when you drink a soda and then you crash and you want more sugar, well stop that cycle because I'll tell you what, real power comes from human kindness. Real power comes from lifting someone up from the bottom and making them feel alive. That's power. And remember, bullying in schools, it will never stop unless the bullies understand the pain that they have caused. They have to walk in the other kid's shoes. In my book, Cracked, it was not until Bull, Maastricht, came face to face with the pain of Victor, that he understood the hideousness and the havoc that he had wreaked. And it took Bull having time to spend, spend time in a psychiatric ward across from Victor and in group, hearing his story, that's when he really got the severity of his actions. But it doesn't have to get that far. It just doesn't, there's no reason for a teenager to feel so isolated and so alone that they attempt or succeed suicide, it doesn't have to get that far. And I ask all of you, how can it get that far? How can a teenager type something like mission accomplished on a girl's Facebook wall who committed suicide after being torturously bullied? Who does things like that? And that was a story in the news, I'm not making that up. How can someone lay their head down at night and get a sound night's sleep, knowing that they humiliated someone so completely that they had to take their own life. And then, type mission accomplished on the Facebook wall. How does the guilt not eat them alive? How are they able to look at themselves in a mirror and not crumble to pieces? What kind of heartless evil is that? 
Seriously. You guys, it just, I don't get it. It doesn't compute in my brain. How can people not watch, how can people watch bullying out there in the world and not do something about it? And I'm not talking about, you know, being all superhero like, like, hey, I see you over there bullying. I see you. Stop that. You know, that's not going to happen. You guys are teenagers. You have reputations to protect. I get it. No one's going to do that. But there are real, subtle, slash, powerful ways to make it stop. Go talk to someone. Maybe it's the kid. I don't know if you have, that takes a lot of courage. Go talk to an adult. It doesn't have to be out in public. Just tell someone you're worried. Tell someone what's going on. Tell an adult in your life. Do something. So in my book, Empty, it's an, another book that's not out yet. It's about an overweight teenage girl. And she gets bullied and abused. And her life just spirals out of control. And I can't tell you how many times I yelled at my computer screen while I was writing this book, somebody do something for this girl. But the people surrounding her, they tried. And they went through the motions, but no one made any bold moves. They kind of just, you know, eh, that's Dell. But they all fail her miserably. So in honor of my main character of Empty, her name is Dell. I have a two-part challenge for everyone in this room, including the adults. Part one, after you leave here and you go back to your lives, your home, your school, your work, I want you to pay attention to the human beings in your life, the people that you know, your family, your friends, all of them, and love them like you mean it. I know that doesn't sound like much of a challenge, but we know sometimes it's really hard to love the people that we're supposed to love. But I'm telling you to show them your love. What does that mean? Make your mom her cup of coffee without being asked. Take the trash out without being asked. Do a load of laundry without being asked. Help your little brother or sister with their homework without being asked. That's showing the people that you love that you love them. Think of other people. Consider their feelings. Tell them you love them. It matters. But here's the second part of the challenge, the really hard part. Pay attention to the human beings in your life that you do not know. The kid, nobody talks to. The girl, everyone picks on. The guy who sits alone at lunch. Those kids, the victors in the real world. But before I go on, I want to tell you that I'm calling this a challenge because I know it's not easy. I get that. It's called a challenge. I'm not stupid, and I know how the world works. I'm not expecting everyone to go off and be best friends. It just doesn't happen. It's not possible, and it's ridiculous. But what is possible? Noticing people. Pay attention. Open your eyes and look around. Who's alone? Who's isolated? Who's bullied? Who's tortured? Who's humiliated? See them. And here's the challenge part. Consider their feelings. Empathize with them. Put yourself in their shoes. Empathetic thinking can literally change your life. When you put yourself in someone else's shoes, you see things from their perspective. You maybe even try to understand where they're coming from. Respect, understanding, and kindness grow out of empathetic thinking. Empathy makes it a whole heck of a lot harder to humiliate someone when you understand where they're coming from. So I challenge you, when you walk out of here today, look at the bullied, look at the invisible through the lens of empathy. Ask yourself, how would I want to be treated? How would I feel if I were invisible? Made to feel less than. And then do something. Smile at them. Hold the door for them. Compliment them. Notice them. Kindness really is contagious. And one of my educational heroes, her name's Linda Reef. She has one of my favorite quotes of all time. We all need to do things, no matter how difficult those things are, because they are the right things to do. I could not agree more. So take a stand, everybody. Do something big. Seize the moments that are in front of you. Shake it up. Words can either lift people up or they can slice them to bits. So ask yourself, how do I want to use my words? Kindness matters. Thank you.